Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar presented by the Chemical Coders Association International and Products Finishing. My name is Sam Whaler. I'm Vice President of Sales for George Cook Sons and I'm pleased to serve as moderator for today's webinar which is the second in a three-part series addressing how to design a better finishing system. Today's session focuses on pretreatment. First of all we want to thank our sponsors for today's webinar, Engineered Finishing Systems, Thermotronics, and Fostoria Industries. I'd also like to note that this presentation will be made available to all participants following the event. And I would encourage you to submit questions online throughout the, the webinar. We'll address those questions at the end of our presentations and take additional questions as time permits. At this time, I'd like to introduce our presenter for today's webinar, Kent Kalusny. Ken received a Bachelor of Arts degree in Chemistry from Knox College, Galesburg, Illinois in 1982. Ken is currently the Technical Director at Coral Chemical, Chemical Company in Zion, Illinois. He has held several positions related to the formulation, application, and evaluation, setup, and troubleshooting of metal surface treatments and processes during his 34 years in the metal finishing business. Ken is a member of the Electrocode Association, Chemical Coders Association International, Powder Coating Institute and Porcelain Enamel Institute. He supports these organizations by conducting pre-paint pre treatment training and presenting technical papers at technical forums and symposiums, really such as this. But you know, if you talk with Ken, he'll quickly tell you that his greatest accomplishment is raising his four daughters. So with that, now to begin this, this webinar is Ken. Good afternoon, this is Ken speaking. This is my first webinar, but uh, I think that we'll be fine getting through this. I, I did take a look at the attendees. The, the lesson plan was created to be a, a basic lesson. I, I don't need to uh, make it a simple thing. I think we need to look at all the basic parameters, situations that affect your, your success and well-being as a company and your product's well-being. Anyhow, I applaud those of you who have many years of experience, as do I. I think it's always a good idea to hear someone else talk about a subject that you know. It sometimes triggers internal thought and inspires ideas. So I applaud uh, all of you for continuing your education and, uh, and participation in the Chemical Coders Association uh, seminars and webinars. So it's a basic lesson about pretreatment. And just as an introduction, we're going to talk about some different aspects. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about definitions, uh, some terminology. Those of you who are starting out uh, in the pretreatment business, uh, some of the definitions will help you understand what I'm about to say. Um, I don't want to spend all time doing definitions, so we're just going to do a few. If you have any questions on any, any of the words I say, just uh, submit an online chat question. We'll clarify those. But we'll talk a little bit about the chemistries involved with the surface treatment. We're not going to include cleaner chemistry. All of these individual situations could be their own webinar. But I, I did thought it was pertinent to understand a little bit about the surface treatment chemistries. Uh, just the terminology pre-treatment suggests the treatment of metals. So it's, it's all of the above, everything that you do. We'll talk about the systems that, uh, which you utilize the pre-treatment chemistry as, long as, uh, as well as how will you control those systems, deliver the solution, and of course there's always going to be at some time going to be an issue and you're going to need to troubleshoot. So we'll talk about what could those quality issues be and how to approach troubleshooting. Uh, so just some basic definitions. Substrate will be a term that you'll hear us use. Substrate basically is the surface of the workpiece. A lot of times people just say substrate, what's your substrate? Well, it's aluminum, it's steel, you know, you can go off into descriptors. What's the alloy of aluminum? What's what's the nature of the steel? Is it hot rolled steel, hot rolled pickle and oil, cold rolled steel? You could go on and on and on with that, but, uh, but specifically it's the surface of the workpiece. You can say what type of metals you, you are utilizing in, in your, your workpiece, but it's really substrates referring to the actual surface. Pre-treatment, not a whole lot to say about that, but it, it, let's, we should break it down and say it's, it's, it's just a way to shorten pre-paint treatment. We're going to talk about all the things that you can do 
to help maintain or achieve quality and maintain or reduce chemical costs. So there's there's actually pre you can say pre-treatment could be for plating could be for anodizing could be for a lot of things, the f but this case the finish is painting so we're doing pre-paint treatment is our pre-treatment. Water break free is a term that's used a lot uh, referring to the cleaning, and uh, there's some images in the in the presentation but it's the characteristic where the water sheets uniformly it doesn't break it doesn't make like a, a V pattern and split from the surface. The significance of talking about water break free is that the organic soil or just soils in general are removed. Reality, it's just the nature of surface tension. If the surface tension of the substrate is less than water, the water sheets. So where does that become important? Well, if you're buffing brass, some stainless steel, it, it's, it's a diff different surface tension. You, sh you could have all the organics that are removed and still have water break. But overall, 99% of the time, you want to see water break free cleaning, and that is one of the water sheets. Soil, you could define soil in a lot of ways. My definition is any chemical compound that is on your substrate that interferes with your quality objectives. Soil, in this case, it's just a, it's a detriment to what your objectives are, your quality objectives. So anything that's on their surface that interferes with it is going to be a soil. I will break down soil into two different classifications, organic and inorganic soils. And we can take this into a deeper, uh, deeper definitions too, but in general, my reference to inorganic soil are, is soil that basically forms a metal salt or bond to the substrate. So there's a lot of examples of that. Generally, inorganic soils are not going to interfere with water break free cleaning. However, inorganic soils may possibly interfere with your ultimate quality. We'll talk more about that later. Organic soil, if you don't remove the organic soil, you're going to see quality issues very quickly. You're going to see pinholes, craters, things of that nature, poor paint adhesion. So we're going to use these definitions a little bit loosely, but in general these, these are true. Titration is a number, uh, uh, another term that we'll, we'll use. And basically a titration is a way to measure how much chemistry or, or how active the chemistry is in your solution. Um, yeah, usually the titration term is used with descriptors, free alkalinity, total alkalinity titration. Maybe it's uh, total acidity, free acidity. It could be a lot of things, but titration you can think of as, a, as you would use a ruler to measure something. We're going to have our ruler to measure how much chemistry is in a solution. And we do that by titrating a solution of unknown strength using a solution, a titrant, of a known strength, and that way we can figure out how much is in the actual solution. Purpose of pretreatment, basically, you're going to get rid of all the surface contaminants that interfere with quality objectives. And depending on what your quality objectives, uh, that inorganic soil may become important. We want to enhance paint adhesion to substrate. And of course, we want to enhance corrosion resistance of the paint. The paint is going to give you most of your corrosion resistance. However, if you don't perform and conduct your pretreatment correctly, you will not be able to utilize the benefits of that particular organic coating or paint. We want to also maintain the paint's aesthetics. I don't want to create any kind of weird patterns from the pretreatment, particularly if you've got a paint that doesn't have very good hiding power. But overall, we want to maintain quality is the purpose of pretreatment. We want to set the foundation so that when we put down the coating that it can be all that it can be, give it all of its adhesion and resistance characteristics. Some things to consider when choosing a pretreatment system, quality is the biggest one. What do you want to achieve? You can, you can use a pretreatment system that is capable of overachieving your quality system and that's always possible, but that's going to be at a cost. It's more of a management decision than any of ours, but 
want to look at what the required quality is. Of course, what metals are we going to treat? What are the substrates? And then, as I said before, the substrates, the surface of that metal. So what are the soils, the type of soils, the age of the soils? Make, make a big difference on how you're going to set up your pretreatment process. Part configuration is important. Basically, the significance of there is you know, how are you going to get inside hidden areas uh, could be a consideration. Another consideration is how much chemistry or solution will it drag out and carry over stage to stage. So part configuration is definitely something that is thought through before choosing a pretreatment system. Of course, the paint. We're going to use an Alcott paint and try to get a thousand hour soft spray. It's not going to happen. Uh, never say never, but uh, that the picture I'm painting is that it would be it would be hard to get achieve a thousand hours with an Alcott paint, and, and I suppose there's exceptions to that. Putting in some chemistry in an Alcott paint that might not be uh, environmentally friendly, but uh, nevertheless, I'm dwelling in details there. The water source very very important. The quality of water. Uh, if you're just trying to get the paint to stick and there is no corrosion resistance specification per se, water quality becomes less important. As you become or your part is more quality oriented, the water source is very important. Also can help first pass efficiency too by having good water. Of course the application equipment. Uh, you need to have certain equipment apply the pretreatment. So based on the available equipment you would choose or consider for the choice of your chemistry. And of course as much as uh, you know you could have it all figured out you still have to deal with the wastes and you'll have some strategy involved there. So there's going to be environmental constraints uh, of some nature. You know some may be the treatment of heavy metals, some maybe just you just got to neutralize it. Some people are in municipalities where you can they just approve putting it down the drain, which is rare, but does happen. But these are these are seven different aspects of what goes into the consideration of a pretreatment system. I want to talk to you a little bit about the chemistries. I'll talk about the new chemistry in a little bit, but iron phosphate is probably the most common still. The newer zirconium oxide treatments are, are gaining market share. But overall, iron phosphates are still pretty common, particularly in areas that aren't as concerned with uh, phosphate discharge. Pretty much any, any state adjacent to the Mississippi River is going to regulate phosphate. But uh, they're easy to use, easy to run. You'll have uh, uh, situations where you can add ingredients such as detergents, surfactants or another name for that, surface active agents. And they, they help uh, provide the cleaning. So that would be a simplistic uh, process, a three-stage process. Iron phosphate, you could separate cleaning from phosphating. In general, anytime you put two chemistries or two functions together, like cleaning and phosphating, you create some compromise. Still may be possible to achieve your quality objectives, but uh, technically it isn't as good. Uh, but you got to define what's best for your system. So sometimes a three-stage detergent iron phosphate and two rinses is, is good enough. The iron phosphates, uh, well, they're having phosphate in them. They're, 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 they contain accelerators, typically oxidizers. And you can take dilute phosphoric acid, dissolve iron in it, and form an iron phosphate on metal. However, accelerators make it happen within the dwell time you typically see in a spray washer. Uh, with mass production uh, happening in the earlier 1900s, this is when accelerators came into play so that they could treat or iron phosphate metal quicker. So you got inorganic and organic accelerators. Fluoride is another chemistry utilized in iron phosphates, not always. If you have an iron phosphate for steel and you need to treat aluminum, you can add fluoride to the bath and it will treat the aluminum. Without the fluoride, it won't treat or create a phosphate complex or surface conversion on aluminum. pH adjusters typically go into that and it's just to maintain the balance 
We'll talk about solution control, but you're going to want to maintain how much chemistry or concentration and how active the concentration is. And that's where the pH adjustment comes into. You could think of it as I need enough gas in the tank, that would be your concentration, and then your accelerator is your pH. How fast are you going to go? How fast are you going to develop coating? What, and of course, what's the coating going to look like, which relates to quality. Zinc phosphate. Uh, I think there's some some people on here that use zinc phosphate. Since this is the basic lesson, generally you're looking at uh, two different chemistry, well, different chemistries, but uh, there's microcrystalline. There's also macro. Macro is large crystals. I would I, I, I when I refer to them, I talk about paint-based zinc phosphate and oil-based zinc phosphate. The heavier zinc phosphate uh, crystals are, are more in line for holding and absorbing oil, some kind of bracket, unpainted bracket. If you make the crystals too large and you paint over those crystals and they get hit by something, the crystals fracture and it compromises paint adhesion. Since we're talking about pre-paint treatment, we're just going to talk about microcrystalline and generally requires an activator or conditioner. People use those two different words synonymously. If you don't use conditioner, you're going to get big zinc phosphate crystals such as this. Use a conditioner, you can bring that crystal structure down. This is going to become very important for your physical quality requirements if you're painting zinc phosphate. Impact, conical mandrel, maybe even paint adhesion would get compromised by having the large crystals. Conditioner is very important. And zinc phosphate, they'll, they'll have modifications. Nickel modified is common. Manganese and nickel are common. Calcium is old school chemistry. And calcium was used to make very small crystals without needing an activator or conditioner. Uh, somewhat rare, but it is still used in the marketplace. Uh, it, the reason it's rare now is they make a lot of sludge. Calcium modified products make a lot of sludge. And that, starts working against you when it starts plugging nozzles. You need to take the sludge out and in general it's a good idea to take sludge out of the zinc phosphate bath as you're running parts. Accelerator is another thing. It's an external accelerator as opposed to the iron phosphates having internal accelerators. And essentially this is just a uh, oxidizer, most commonly sodium nitrite, takes iron out of the bath to which you don't deposit iron phosphate. If you're low on accelerator, typically your zinc phosphate process makes iron phosphate. So you want to take the iron out with the use of an accelerator. Won't take a whole lot of time on chromates. Hexavalent chromates are on their way out. Uh, a lot of different environmental directives uh, pushing that. Hexavalent chromates are still used, but most commonly if they're going to use chrome, they're going to go to a trichrome process. Uh, more common to the marketplace these days is the zirconium oxide treatments. And I indicate here that there's inorganic, organic, and combinations. The organic would imply that they're putting in some kind of polymer, or silanes are common, uh, to which it, it'll behave differently in the bath. So you can have inorganic or organic, and a lot of times combinations where they'll use some kind of zirconium compound. And essentially to pH adjust the uh, silane or polymeric type coating and that way it uh, uh, provides a, a surface pretreatment. A lot of names get thrown around here. I thought that might be worth just saying a little stuff. Um, uh, since the technology is relatively new, um, you know, people are struggling, uh, how do you define it? I've been saying zirconium oxide lately because I hear automotive people talking about it and generally in our industry automotive leads the way and uh, the rest of us general industry industrial people uh, follow but uh, yeah, of course with the technology being new people want to brand their name so you have certain technology of course then uh, trying to define these things people describe them thin film I, I like that one that's a it's very significant to the zirconium oxide uh, treatments We'll talk more about why that is in a few slides, but uh, transition metal coatings, 
Uh, it was still a little bit vague, but it, it implies that you're depositing transitional metals onto the surface. And then some people use a vague or advanced pretreatment. There's a lot of names thrown around there. Some people simplify it sometimes, just say nano, but all kind of names that are referred to this, this technology. I'm not going to talk a whole lot about mechanical pretreatment. Basically, it's the blasting off of soils. Um, you can see in the image here that uh, how clean it can look. Very good at taking rust off. Also, mechanical uh, pretreatment or blasting um, is 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 advised for hot rolled steel if you're looking for higher quality, or you're fabricating a part that experiences high stress. And the reason why is if the hot rolled scale fractures, you know, everything that's on top of it, it's going to go too. So um, I'm going to talk more about chemical pretreatment. I think that's more likely why you signed up to come to the webinar. There's manual systems, aka spray wand systems, typically used for larger parts um, or, or startup businesses. You want to, you got to start somewhere to get into business, so you don't have the money to invest in expensive equipment. So spray wand could be a way to go. Of course, there's spray processes, typically where you have a solution fed through plumbing, ultimately through a nozzle to spray the parts, transported at, typically on a conveyor of some sort. Version systems. You, you'll have uh, basically just a tank that you, some people say dip, you dip them into the tank. Always a good idea to have uh, agitation and in, in, in this image you can see that it utilizes the ductors. Just gets, uh, just helps efficiencies. I mean the pretreatment system isn't just about chemistry, it's physics and chemistry. So anytime you can move that solution, whether through spraying or agitation with a ductor system, you can help the chemistry do its job quicker and more thoroughly. In general, whether you're choosing uh, immersion or a spray system, generally more, stra more stages there are, the better the quality potential. Um, and uh, it doesn't always have to be that way, but it, it, it can be. It's very much, you start separating the functions and, and if you do it correctly, it definitely means greater quality. Of course, you got to weigh that against capital expenditure. Um, you might not be able to put in that multi-stage washer, but um, but if you put in the extra stages, such as tandem rinsing, where you, let's say you clean, rinse, rinse, iron phosphate, rinse, rinse, you start creating the ability to counterflow water, reducing your water usage, reusing your water, recapturing chemistry, recapturing latent heat, uh, carries over, mass transfer. So, of course, you're going to spend more money, but you're going to save, you're going to save it in chemistry, too. And the savings is, is, is actually substantial. All right, choosing a system, mechanical, be substrate conditions, like I said with the hot rolled steel, you're at the mercy, if you leave that scale on, you're at the mercy of how, how well the mill does its maintenance practice in the hot roll mill. You could bury a lot of stuff in that scale, and if you try to start removing it, you unearth these things that are buried. Most people who do my job for our, my competitors will tell you the best thing to really do is alkaline clean and rinse. There are some other things, but in general, you do not want to pickle that scale because you remove that iron oxide and leave carbon smut behind. So the best thing to really do is if you're quality oriented and you got to remove that scale. So mechanical pretreatment is the best way to do it. If you try to pickle off the hot rolled scale, it, it requires a lot of temperature, time, and concentration. Now the reason for a mechanical pretreatment system would be low production volumes. You don't have a lot of parts to do. Don't want to invest in a lot of equipment. Manual spray wands, another one for startup companies, but uh, more geared towards large parts. You're not going to build a washer for something that's going to, let's say, a caterpillar or payloader. You know, it's just not going to happen. It would be a very large system and very expensive to run. 
choosing an immersion system, essentially eco lines where you got to be concerned about internal cleanliness. You don't want to bring oil and metal fines down in your eco tank. Um, you want to try to keep that as clean as possible. Park configuration, depending on your cleanliness needs, and there's no doubt immersion system can get to all areas versus a spray system if there's a, a part or an angle of the part that blocks an internal surface it's going to be difficult to clean um, and other other now would be batch operations small small or lower throughput power spray washers are generally what you see for the larger uh, high production lines and it uh, gives you greater efficiency you got that that additional physics of the spray impingement to help dislodge soils um, typically because of that physical uh, enhancement of the chemistry you don't need to use as much chemical in the washer in the stage and then you got less chemical to carry out of the stage as well manual systems drilling into that a little bit more you'll you'll see people talking about steam systems and the high pressure hot water systems and you'll hear and this could be played back and forth you'll hear people talk about oh this, the hot water pressure systems are better than steam we got to define you everything though if your constraint uh, to put waste down the drain is high then steam system might be good because it's not going to put out as much volume and hence you're going to put less chemistry to drain however the other side is well with a hot pressure system you're shooting more mass at the part so you get better cleaning this is true too all I'm suggesting is is you need to define what's best for your operation and sometimes people have collection systems and reutilize the chemistry um, that one it really comes down to your particular situation what's best there is auxiliary equipment that'll go along with the systems Foamy units are popular and you know, some people use gels if you want to uh, address well burn on your parts separately from trying to spray a lot of chemical to get it it's a good way to do it just foam foam that chemistry right to where you need it to clean up the part and then rinse it off and go with your your treatment and then of course sometimes they employ low pressure spray tanks that would be typical for well, if they had to have multi steps to the manual process, but most commonly it would be to apply a seal rinse, a final seal rinse to enhance corrosion. Day tanks basically would be as if you wanted to just dilute down a lot of a post rinse and and get a pH adjusted, and then you can just flow it out onto the surface, and uh, it's all ready to go. Give you some examples of organic soils. Uh, oils, fats, waxes, uh, used in a lot of different things, but definitely rust preventatives. The uh, most common example of that would be mill steel, coils of steel you get in your shop. Maybe you're getting in uh, uh, pallets of blanked material. Metalworking fluids, organic in nature. Cutting fluids, also drawing compounds. Stamping fluids. Of course, greases and hydraulic fluids uh, come off the equipment that is used to fabricate parts. So that could be on your parts too, buffing compounds, mold release agents, other examples. The inorganic soils really def deals with the metals. In this case, smut and metal fines is more related to uh, uh, ferric carbon. Uh, metal fines, of course, from cutting of the metal. Laser and weld oxides. Uh, more more likely things that you're going to entail, encounter, and what you need to remove in pre-treatment. A little example of laser oxide, you can see that how it's eh, somewhat shiny. Of course, weld oxide, pretty clean weld actually. You just see the heat affected zone. Then you got corrosion oxides. This is an interesting part here. You may have seen that in other presentations, but uh, you actually got the metal moving three different directions here. And there's a lot of force definitely on this edge right here. Can't really tell from the photo, but you can see how it's affected the texture of the metal. But notice these recessed areas, how they look stained, suggest iron oxide. More than likely it is. Uh, 
it really comes down to, well, it could be aging in general, but it's also the nature of the chemistry. If you could picture that this piece of steel was formed and it needed a lubricant to form it to keep it from tearing, and, the, and if you think about the clearances of a die past the work piece, how do you keep that solution there to give you lubricity? You have to have ingredients in the lubricant that helps hold it to the metal. This is what we call a chemical reaction, right? And this is how those organic soils can form inorganic soils. Fatty, ester, fatty esters, um, a lot of different organic chemistry uh, that's used in organic soils can ultimately react with the surface to form inorganic soil. Of course, mill soil we talked a little bit about. Any kind of passivation, probably more common to people processing galvanized metal where it has comes in and it doesn't seem to be treatable. A lot of times it'll have a clear chromate, somewhere between one and two milligrams per square foot of uh, chromium. It's non-detectable by the eye, but you'll see it <laughs> not treat when it goes through your washer. Dust and dirt you could say is inorganic. Water quality, I'd say, looking over my career, is, is, is something that gets overlooked. So I preach it a lot. And uh, in essence, uh, you could make this a webinar in itself, too. But we could talk about well and city water. It's going to have a certain amount of hardness. Deionized, narrow water, you, you're probably familiar with. This is two different techniques used to take the solids out of the water. And what are those solids? You may not see them, but they're dissolved into the water. Well, you could break the hard water into cations and anions. The cations, examples, calcium, iron, magnesium, these things like to form sludge and scale in a wash system, particularly with phosphates and silicates. It can be either one, doesn't have to be both. Uh, so so you, you start seeing situations where the sludge and the, and the scale starts forming, starts blocking the plumbing, reducing the diameter of uh, risers, plugging nozzles. As far as quality goes, those dry solids are hygroscopic, meaning once they're dried, they will absorb water. So picture drying these solids under paint and your your workpiece is used in a moist, humid, wet environment. I've, I've heard corrosion engineers talk about how organic coatings, aka paints, can absorb four to five times their, their weight in water. Water can penetrate to the substrate, so if you have these solids dried onto your part, you could have done the best thing possible to your part, and then by drying those cations on there, you, you start absorbing water, form blisters, compromise adhesion, which leads to corrosion. If your water has a lot of anions in there, such as sulfate and chloride, now you have absorbed water and you have a corrosion initiating ion or ions, if you got both sulfate and chloride, to initiate corrosion. Good idea to have DIRI water as your final rinse as, as a minimum. And of course, uh, if you got too high of a chloride content, I'll use that specifically because I've seen that before. It, it gets aggressive on equipment. I've seen I've seen chloride alone eat eat up a stainless steel burner tube. The image you see in the uh, right hand side there is, is a favorite of mine. One because it looks intriguing. We can't really go through this whole picture, but you can notice the blue area here. One day, part looked completely blue. Another day later on, we started seeing these little rust spots form. After a lot of testing, bath analysis, and investigation, turns out the city where this custom coder was, the city had seven wells that they drew from for the city water. And they don't announce to everybody they're going to change the well, they just do it. And the water went from 100 ppm chloride, which is terrible, to 300 ppm, which is horrendous. So just by getting rid of the chloride, actually they added RO capability, they got rid of those spots. Chloride, if, if anything you take away from this, this presentation, chloride is not good. You want to have nice, you do everything to optimize your part, to paint it, 
you want a, the last thing to be nice clean water. Let's talk a bit about solution control and to set that up we're going to talk about a traditional five stage system. In essence it's an alkaline clean followed by water rinse, an iron phosphate, uh, water rinse after that and then final rinse which could include a seal rinse, a chemical that you buy or you could just use DIRO water as well. The purpose of the alkaline cleaner is to remove the organic soils. And sometimes it's also to remove the inorganic soils if, if that's necessary. Generally it's a wise idea if you're going to have a zirconium oxide pretreatment system. And basically we're just looking to prepare the part for surface treatment. To do this correctly you're going to want to maintain your time, temperature, and your spray pressure. Now there's times when you're going to want to turn the conveyor up or at least the production people will. When that happens perhaps a, a change in concentration and uh, uh, a temperature will counteract the reduction of time but uh, there's always some things you could do work with your pretreatment vendor if, if you're going to make some changes on your pretreatment system. We want to maintain that solution delivery system We'll talk a bit about that later. We want to keep them nozzles delivering a solution in a methodical manner. So part hanging and conveyance is also important to the pretreatment process. And obviously we want to control the concentration of the alkaline cleaner. We do that with an acid base titration. You see a burette here in the image and that's for your titration. Yeah, they don't typically dye titration solution but uh, the titration of a known strength use a color indicator in the case of free alkalinity people use phenolphthalein and titrate from print pink slash red to original color of bath stop and then you look at the burette find your number and usually you're just going to run a number let's say between uh, 5 and 6 mil or 8 and 10 mil kind of number you know normally talk concentration all the time just you could convert mills to concentration by use of a factor, but basically it's just a way to standardize the measurement so you're consistent every test. Stage two purpose is to remove the cleaner residue. We also want to reduce alkaline carryover. We don't want that alkalinity carrying down to the iron phosphate. It could interfere with the uh, uh, quality or adherence of the iron phosphate, but more also, that's some pretty important, but also more commonly I should say, it, it, it's going to keep from neutralizing your acid and you having to use more iron phosphate than necessary. Stage two's purpose also could be to use for makeup water for evaporative loss in stage one. Good idea. Recapture chemistry in water and heat. And for this one, we're going to maintain the similar things, time, temperature, spray pressure. We want to make sure our solution delivery system is maintained, making sure nozzles are positioned correctly and clear. But for the chemistry test, we're going to look for conductivity or total dissolved solids. Some people will also use a titration method to judge uh, carryover. Not the best way, but if it works for you, then great. Um, a TDS meter like you see in the, the image on the screen it works just fine. Conductivity uh, more specific to what's in the tank but uh, either will work basically as soon as you attribute a uh, maximum uh, value for your your carryover maintain it below that and as long as quality is being maintained you're doing the right thing. If you ever need to look at uh, reducing water consumption then judge it by changes in quality. If you see that by raising your TDS or conductivity maximum up reduces quality then obviously you need to put it back to where it was to keep your quality. Stage three, passivate the substrate is the main purpose. Um, you can say this in a lot of different ways but the use of the word passivate gives the uh, significance that it is inactive if it's passive. We want to make that surface as chemically passive as possible so it doesn't rust. Nothing's forever but we want to reduce that occurrence, prolong the life of the part that you're producing. 
course, we want to enhance paint adhesion and corrosion resistance with, with iron phosphate. Once again, I'm going to sound like a broken record here. Maintain time, temperature, pressure. We want to maintain our solution delivery. Keep our nozzles clear, our risers and nozzles positioned correctly. For iron phosphate, we'll, we'll check out our concentration. We do that with a total acid titration. And then uh, that tells us we got enough of the accelerator in the phosphate chemistry to do the job. Then we want to control the throttle to the reaction, and that would be pH, or there's titrations that also get used, uh, referred to as as consumed or free acid titration. So whichever way you go, it doesn't matter to me as long as you're consistent. And if you're using pH, just remember to uh, calibrate your pH probe and if your pH probe starts doing weird things, it probably needs to be replaced. If you're not sure, ask your vendor. Stage four is a rinse. We're going to want to remove the iron phosphate residue. Actually, we want to stop that reaction too. Very important to have cool water after iron phosphate. Those using chamber processes with tanks that are adjacent, that subsequent rinse can get really hot and contaminated. You want to keep those clear nice and clean and cool. You want to stop that phosphate reaction. You've, you've set it up to do, be the best it can be. If you let it linger on with dilute chemistry, that can react to the surface. It's just going to degrade what you achieved. And of course, we want to rinse that phosphate stuff off to protect or prevent further contamination of stage five. And of course, we want to avoid dry down of the treatment. And then we can also use stage four water to counterflow and make up for evaporative loss in the stage three iron phosphate. We want to maintain time, time, temperature, and concentration as well as spray pressure. And once again, it's a rinse, so conductivity and TDS is just a nice, easy test to do. Fast test to do, too. Stage five, once again, we want to stop the surface reaction if we're just rinsing. If we're going to use a seal rinse, of course, we're going to have that reaction, but we want to further remove acidic residues. And of course, this will enhance corrosion resistance. We maintain, once again, you guys already know, as I, it's, it's, it's pretty simple stuff. You want to control your process, so there's some very basic things you need to do. Maintain the physics, the time, pretty much a given, your temperature, spray pressure. Generally, last stages aren't heated, but some do. And then we want to be able to deliver a solution. You could have, you could have the best chemistry in the world, but if, if half your stages are, or half your rises are plugged, you're not going to have the best treatment reflecting that product. If you employ a final seal rinse, some kind of purchase chemistry, then you're going to want to maintain concentration and pH. And you still want to look at conductivity and dissolved solids because remember, this is the last thing that dries on your part. It's, it's going to affect quality. All right. Results of poor pretreatment. Well, corrosion. You can kind of get a sense that there's some blistering going on here. Look at it a little closer. You start looking at uh, paint adhesion issues. If you're lucky, you catch it in your plant. If you're not, it goes out in the field and then they call you up and tell you what kind of job you did. That's never a pleasant experience. Uh, you can see this little scene right here. Collected water probably didn't dry all that well. Contain a lot of residue. Usually it seems like this, the first in, last out principle applies. So whatever went in there first, like an alkaline cleaner, is going to come out. So that's not good for paint adhesion. And ultimately, you could have both. Of course, this image, I think, is a bit more than poor pretreatment. I think you got problems with the paint as well. It's pretty dramatic. In fact, you can kind of see. Um, I'm hoping you can see my cursor. You can see how it's rusting. And you can see areas that are bare, too. This is a lot of stuff going on. The moisture pretty much just ran underneath this paint. So there was something also interfering with adhesion and, of course, the uh, passivation isn't enough to stop corrosion when it's 5% salt water, which is used in salt spray testing. 
to drill in a little bit deeper into uh, solution delivery, you want to have some strategy or maintenance procedure for checking nozzles. You want to make sure that they're clear and clean and make sure you have a nice pattern. Um, kind of an old school saying, but it still fits, is you don't want to use a welding rod to poke a nozzle clear. You're just pushing what poked the nozzle or plugged the nozzle back into the nozzle and it's just going to come and plug the nozzle again. Most, most, most systems these days have the little union with the uh, removable plastic spray nozzle. Comes out like an eye socket, remove the residue from the inside of the back of the nozzle and the little cavity where the eye socket goes, put your nozzle back on. And when you do, you want to have your nozzle pointing in a certain direction. We'll show you why that's important in the next slide or how it looks, but typically when you're walking through the washer to your left, you can do this either way, but to your left you want your nozzle on a flat, flat spray nozzle pointing at the 11 and 5 position if you're looking at a, a clock, a dial phase clock, and on the opposite side you have the nozzle pointing the other way. So you're basically having it off center. If you put it on center, this is usually where I use my hands in a in a seminar, but uh, you start getting these spray patterns hitting each other. If we look at the next image, you can see what happens. If you put it on that slight angle, this is a little dramatic, uh, but if you put it on that slight angle, now these, these sprays don't hit each other. The significance is, is that if they hit each other, you just lost the power of the impingement that you just created by having you know, certain pump, certain nozzle size, and uh, and and position. You'll notice too. Also, these ends, we don't we don't cock the nozzles off center on the ends. Basically, is to help create a a uh, a curtain to keep any kind of stray mist from leaving the stage. And in some cases, it's 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 hard to do, but it does reduce air and spray getting into the next stage. We look at the staggering of nozzles, so riser to riser, you'll talk about the, the nozzles being on, let's say, 12 inch centers, and then we stagger them six inches riser to riser. Well, you can see in these different I images, first riser, you get your setup with the four nozzles on the side here, of course, the ones on the bottom and the top. Next one, you can see how that position has been offset, and when we put them together, so you can see an image to suggest what I'm trying to say, you make a very full spray pattern. This way you guarantee coverage, complete coverage on your workpiece. You don't have preferential areas that get great cleaning and areas that get marginal cleaning. You want to have it nice and uniform. If we look top down at the washer, you got an idea here. Generally on the edges you cock these risers back and that's to help keep the spray in the stage. You don't want spray carrying over you want to do the job in the stage and then basically stop that reaction, get things rinsed off and move to the next reaction. So a lot of things, I mean, as far as how far this angle goes in, it depends on your workpiece, how big your line is. There's a, there's a certain maximum. You can't point them all the way to the center. You, you're going to just minimize how much spray time you have. Um, so you're going to have to look into what kind of strategy or maybe if you're going to make adjustments, do it slowly and see what what helps maximize things. Uh, and if you got to live with a little spray leaving that stage, then then that's the way it is. You know, you want to make sure you get parts clean and treated and thoroughly rinsed. So you don't want to turn them all to the center just to avoid spray mist. Most commonly for pretreatment systems, you'll find sprat, flat spray or V-jet nozzles. That's more of a trade name. Basically, you can see here how they spray. It makes it a little orbital. Flat spray nozzles are intended to give you more impingement. If you look close at them, you'll see a couple numbers on the nozzles. And typically, if you if you read this top to bottom, 65. This is a 6550. And the top ID stands for the spray angle created. And of course, that's at a certain uh, pressure. Um, and then the bottom one is how many gallons a minute. You don't show a decimal place in there, but a 50 is a 5.0 gallons per minute nozzle. 
NAD net gets important to the engineering of the system. Your pump's got a certain pump rate, and you want to be able to make sure you got enough pressure going to the amount of nozzles in your in your washer to get good coverage of your part. So you want to be certain of those numbers. A lot of times these plastic ones are color coded, and uh, and that way you know which color belongs in the stage. It's a useful thing to do. Hollow or full cone nozzles, the other nozzles you, you'll see in a, in a pre-paint treatment washer. Hollow cone is more pertinent to the surface conversions. Iron phosphate can be applied with the flat spray nozzles. You can, well, you can apply anything with the flat spray nozzles. However, to optimize a zinc phosphate or a zirconium oxide treatment, you're better off using low pressure, uh, hollow cone, or full cone nozzles. Uh, and well, if you use full cone, you want to keep your pressure down. But usually, hollow cone doesn't give you that much pressure. Helps you to build coating easier. You want more flooding action for your pretreatment. You want more impinging action with your cleaner. Troubleshooting. Basically, you're just looking for clues. You know, if, if it's something easy to solve, obviously you're going to just solve it. But basically, let's talk about the problems that are harder. You want to define the problem. You know, where does it happen? When does it happen? How often does it happen? And by defining those, you start building scenarios of how could this happen. And at that point, you're developing theories, and then at that point, you, you follow up with ruling theories in or out. But look for the clues. Water break, if you're not seeing cleaning, water break free cleaning, you obviously you want to make sure you get your water break free cleaning and then see if the problem continues. Flash rusting, another one, where does it happen? And then just look for the potential sources to explain why these patterns happen, why these events happen. Now once again, you're going to be redundant, but you want to look for water break free cleaning. If you look at these images on the right, you can notice this one was dipped. In, once again, you see that staining. This is chlorinated paraffin. It's tenacious, but you can see this was dipped just so you can see the water beads. You can see some of them here and there. And then, of course, after cleaning the water sheets, this was actually wet. But if you're not sure what's going on, a real quick way to find out should I be calling my paint vendor or my pre treatment vendor for help? Because I got somebody on my back saying, fix this problem now. Hang some Bonderite 1000 panels, uh, or if you have any kind of standard panels, doesn't have to be Bonderite 1000, it's just a common panel, tent panel available, um, and it's been already treated. At that point, you hang that panel on the line after the pretreatment washer and before the dry-off oven. Hang another Bonderite 1000 before the paint booth. And then you may even hang a blank panel through your washer, and then when they all come through, does which problems still exhibit the problem? For this example, let's use cratering. If the cratering still is on the pretreated panel and does not show up on the either either the Bronderite thousand panels, you know the problems in the pretreatment washer. There's where your focus needs to be. If you see that the Bronderite one thousand panel that goes through the paint booth has craters, but the one that went through the oven doesn't you know the problem is somehow related to the paint system. If the craters show up on the oven, the panel, the dry-off oven panel, but not the Bonnery 1000 that just went through the paint booth, now you know that there's some problem being created in the dry-off oven. So the nice thing about the Bonnery 1000 panels is it takes your chemistry out of the equation, the chemistry that you're using in your pretreatment washer. Abrading the panel, that's basically a little 3M pad, maybe some sandpaper, just something to abrade the surface. Maybe there's something on the surface that's interfering with quality. You would do that if, let's say, you get water break free cleaning and you still get a problem. Remove what's on the surface, see if that helps you out. That'll, that'll give some good input to where to go fix the problem, particularly help your preacher and vendor figure it out too. Differential panel analysis, simply stated, is basically um, bypass selective stages of the washer methodically and you can start pinpointing where the problem is.
For starters, you'd bypass the alkaline cleaner, solve a cleaner panel, or make up a fresh cleaner solution, wipe it down, uh, rinse it, hang it on the line, and then see if that shows the problem. And just stage by stage, you can find out where the problem is. I've done it that way before to find out it was some kind of residue in the final rinse stage that was being redeposited on the panels that caused adhesion problems. So um, sometimes there's trial and error involved with it, but and most troubleshooting is. If you knew how to solve it, it would be solved. Quality issues, basically pinholes, craters, paint adhesion problems, typical for poor cleaning. And those also could be poor treatment, poor pretreatment. Adhesion, of course, too. Appearance, corrosion resistance would be more related to poor treatment. Um, you know, the pinholes could be also created in other ways too, but typically these things are, are what are the problems of poor pretreatment. And why would that change? You got it set up? Well, water metal sources change, people change lubricants, and sometimes you don't you don't know you sometimes you don't have control on it. If there's any way you can find out and be ahead of the game and have certain parties tell you when they're going to make a change, then at least you know it's coming. Perhaps uh, metal fabrication department, you can get to know that foreman or supervisor. Say, hey, if you're ever going to change things, let me know. I'd like to test it out. Just make sure everything's good. Uh, you might be just responsible for your bottom line, and 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 that that fabrication supervisor is responsible for theirs, but. And overall, the company's got to do well, so it's in the best interest of everybody to make sure you know what's happening. Potential cause, lack of proper solution control. You maintain them parameters, you're going to maintain your, your quality. And then once again, you got to keep, you got to keep the system clear. You, gotta have, you can have the best chemical set up in the best manner, but if you're not delivering it, delivering it to the part, what really what good is it? You got to keep a nozzle strategy, you got to keep the nozzles and adductors for immersion systems clear so that you um, can do a good job. And of course you want to maintain your heating system. With that, that's pretty much the stuff. You basically want to control the inputs to your system and control what you can and you will uh, control your destiny. In general, be as proactive as possible and you can eliminate a lot of these problems. So I say right now we want to open up to questions. Okay, Ken, thank you. That's that's excellent material, great presentation. Um, we are getting very close to the appointed time, so we're not going to be able to get through all of the questions, but let's start out with a couple here. Um, first one here is comparing iron phosphate to zinc. Uh, as a general rule, how many more hours of salt spray does zinc provide over iron? Oh, boy, that's that's a tough question. I, I can't give you absolute numbers. I, if I had to throw out a number because they want to walk away with something, let's say twice, I mean, once again, it comes down to paint. There's no doubt zinc phosphate is a better corrosion preventative uh, than iron phosphate, but it's, it's, the paint is doing most of your work when it comes to that. I mean, if I, if I took iron phosphate and stuck it in a salt spray chamber with no paint and zinc phosphated panel and stuck it in a salt spray chamber with no paint, 24 hours I open up that chamber, they're both going to be rusty. There's probably going to be more rust on the iron phosphate panel, but I don't, I don't there's, the problem is, is I'm a chemist and I'm going to, I think of all the considerations in general. I would say iron phosphate, if we compared one paint, I'd tell you if you could get, if you had, let's say, to a 9 rating, which is pretty darn good for iron phosphate, let's say 500 hours, I'd say you could probably get 1,000 hours with zinc phosphate. Okay, okay. Just, just real quickly then, how would you, how would you say the transitional metal um, chemicals compare? The, I would put the transitional um, metals, the zirconium oxide treatments, in between iron and zinc. For iron phosphate, it's much better. Zirconium oxide isn't quite as good as the zinc phosphate, but we got to talk about that. There's been a lot of people change from zinc phosphate to the zirconium oxide treatments. The reason why is they can give them the corrosion resistance and also exceed their expectations. A lot of the HVAC suppliers have done this. Automotive, if you've been to any of those uh, 
seminars, workshops, whatever. I mean, they're going that way. There's like 800 million vehicles on the road now that were once zinc phosphate and now zirconium oxide. Some things to consider on steel, zirconium oxide isn't as good as uh, uh, the zinc phosphate. However, on aluminum, it's really close, and you got a lot less problems with the zirconium oxide. So there's there's a, there's a lot of little details of what's going on that, that would give you an absolute quality. But I know Chrysler ran a study, and it there's some of the zirconium oxide near near the appearance of zinc phosphate. So I, I it's it's really close, and I would think that give it another ten years. The zirconium oxides probably will be better than the zinc phosphates. Okay. All right. Thank you. We have uh, a number of other really great questions on here, but we're we're out of time. Um, I I'm, I believe that I'm safe in saying that we can post these questions to the Chemical Coders website or our products finishing online. I know that this presentation will be made made available within a few days. Uh, for participants to uh, get copies of from those websites from CCAI and from products finishing online. So we'll also try and follow up with some of these questions as well. With that, Ken, unless you have something else, I'll tell everyone thank you very much. I'd like to thank everybody too for coming. I appreciate the support of the CCAI and and if anybody had any questions they want to ask me, I'll, I'll be glad to answer any of them. Great. And once again, thanks to the sponsors, Engineered Finishing Systems, Thermotronics, and Fosteria, Fosteria today. With that, I'll sign off. Bye. Have a good day.